All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, we are in a series called Call Out. We are learning what it means to be a person of prayer as we're praying through the Psalms. We're seeking to understand how to connect with God in daily prayer by using the model of the Lord's Prayer of up, down, in, and out. We've mentioned before that a majority of the Psalms were written by King David, who is considered a man after God's own heart. And we've talked about how David connects with God by talking with him through prayers of satisfaction, lament, confession, thanksgiving, etc. But he may have been closer to understanding God's heart than even he realized. Within some of his psalms, as he's describing his situation and his understanding about God, he's also preparing prophetic descriptions of the true king to come, God in human form, Jesus. And so today, we'll be looking at Psalm 22, as Holly read for us, as a prayer to God that Jesus fulfills as the Messiah, the long-awaited rescuer of Israel. So let me pray for our time together, and then we'll dig in. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that you are the master storyteller, that you weave our lives together for your glory. Pray today as we go through this psalm that people will fall deeper in love with the gospel, with your story. Pray that your words will stick with them and not mine. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So it's been a while. We were out of town last week for Philly, um, but last time we were together, Rustin talked about psalms of praise. And one of the things that leads me to praise God is seeing God as this master storyteller. And I love learning about how the Bible is one connected story that all points to Jesus. And that's why I'm so excited to dive into Psalm 22 with you. It's one of my favorites because of that reason. And remember, as we get into it, that this is David talking to God hundreds of years before Jesus. Okay? So, Psalm 22, we're going to start in verse 1. It says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Maybe that sounds familiar. We've talked about David writing psalms of lament before, but maybe this first line is tickling a hyperlink in the back of your head to something that Jesus said, and you'd be right, uh, when he was lamenting on the cross. Look at Matthew 27, 46. It's almost the exact same words. In about the ninth hour, Jesus on the cross cries out with a loud voice, saying, Ele, ele, leme sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So what is going on here? How did David know what Jesus would be saying as he was dying on the cross? Well, he did it. Uh, but he has this deep relationship with God. He talks to him honestly day after day, and he connects with the heart of the Father. Um, that's what prayer can do for us. It connects us with God's heart. It's interesting to think that David's pain in his current situation can be used by God in the redemptive plan to save the world. Maybe we should ask, would that change how we look at the difficulties we're in if we knew it could be used to save others later on? The master storyteller, the one who redeems, is able to transform the hurt we're going through into something that will benefit other people. I don't know why I got cancer or why Holly and I are unable to have kids, but I have seen how God has redeemed that pain to connect with other people that are hurting and to create opportunities to reach kids that are lost. God doesn't create our pain, but he doesn't waste it either. We're going to jump down a little bit to verse 6 in Psalm 22. David says, But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. David is in despair. People are mocking him for how he serves the Lord. He says people are wagging their heads, which is kind of an odd phrase, and he feels like nobody can relate. But again, let's look at what Jesus experienced on the cross in Matthew 27, verse 39. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads, and saying, You who would destroy the temple, rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you're the Son of God, come down from the cross. And so also the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him, saying, He saved others and he can't save himself. He's the King of Israel. 
Let him come down from the cross and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I'm the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. God came in human flesh and felt our pain. He knows what it's like to be put down and mocked in the most extreme ways. He is Emmanuel, God with us. In Hebrews 4, 15 through 16, it's a great description of this. It says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been as tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Back to Psalm 22 in verse 9. It says, Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust at my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Even as David is reflecting on his early days of following God and being with his mother, Jesus' story still connects to this psalm. Look in John 19, again at the cross, in verse 26. Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby. And he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to his disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour the disciple took her to his own home. Back to Psalm 22. Listen to the visceral pain and thirst of David in verse 14. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, which is a broken piece of ceramics. And my tongue sticks to my jaw. You lay me in the dust of death. David repeats this feeling in another psalm, in Psalm 69, 21. They gave me poison for food, and for my thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. Which is exactly what Jesus experiences on the cross in John 19, verse 28. And after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. And a jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine with a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. Let's go back to the psalm. I know we're going back and forth. It's all going to come together. Verse 16, David says, For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircle me. Look at this. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. We can probably already guess where this connection is going. We don't even have to jump, probably. In John 19, verse 17 and 18, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is Golgotha. And there they crucified him with two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. David's pain points to the hope of the cross. We're not done yet. Verse 18 keeps going. David says, They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots which is exactly what we see in, in Jesus' story in John 19, 24. They said to one another, let's not tear at his clothes, but cast lots for it to see wh whose they shall be. And this was to fulfill the scripture, which says they divided my garments among them, for my clothing they cast lots. And so the soldiers did these things. Back in Psalm 22, verse 19, but you, O Lord, do not be far off, O oh, you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver, me from my, deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Look at Matthew 27. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Back to David, verse 30. Posterity shall serve them. It shall be told of the Lord of the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. And in John 29, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So how, how do we react to this psalm? How do we react to this messianic psalm that points to Jesus' death on the cross? I think the only response is worship. When you read a psalm like this, when you pray through a psalm like this, we should be moved to gasp. You, God, are holy. You are over everything in ways that don't make sense, that I can't fathom, that you are the divine storyteller, 
that has a plan from the beginning. And you move in men's hearts to tell your story even when they don't realize it. So this series is about prayer. So what is our response then in prayer? What is the the downward aspect of prayer? With all the other Psalms, it's a little more straightforward of how to pray in Psalms of confession or praise or things like that, right? So what do we do with this messianic Psalm? And as I was preparing for this sermon, I came to a realization that we stop asking what do we do, that we simply stand in awe. And that is the point of the gospel, that there is nothing that we could do but be mesmerized and moved by the goodness and greatness of Jesus. We revel in the wonder of the gospel because the gospel is good news that leads to the kingdom of the God of wonder being made known among his people in the world. And so what is this gospel? this good news. It's that God created the world, and it was perfect, and humanity was created in the image of God as his representatives. But humans chose sin and rebellion against God, and so the world became broken and imperfect. And the dark disease of sin spread and led to more and more pain and suffering. God saw all the evil that ran rampant in the world, and he would have been just to destroy it all since death is what we deserve. But because of his love, he decided to bring us back into the family. And so God chose a family to show people what the world would be like if they were following him, and they could be in a relationship with him. And this family grew into a nation, and they also time and time again sinned and broke the relationship. They said, we don't need you, God. But God said, I still love you, and I still want you, that you are my children. But now there's brokenness, and that separates us. But I'm going to make a way. There's a way we can be back together in that perfect relationship. Um, There's a debt that has to be paid. So God came down in human form to be one of us as his son Jesus. And Jesus healed people and spoke the good news that there's a way out of this brokenness. There's a way we can be back in that perfect relationship with God. We just have to choose him. But again, his people said, we don't need you, God. And they brutally murdered him. They crucified him in a horrific, savage death. And because Jesus was God, he still wins. His death on the cross served as taking our place in the death we deserved. The debt had been paid on our behalf, for God so loved the world. But it didn't end there. Jesus didn't just die. He rose from the dead on the third day and came back and reigns as the king with God in heaven. And he still wants us to be with him, if only we will recognize we need a savior, and Jesus is that salvation. Put simply, in John 3.16, Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That is more than enough for us to be in awe of who God is. Early churches and cathedrals were designed to have tall open spaces with images of God in heaven painted at the top so people's eyes would be drawn to look up and squint to see what's way up there, to feel a sense of mystery and awe of the grandeur of being in the presence of God. I have a couple examples. Um, One example is this building here. Uh, This kind of intentional architecture is called the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. It's built in the 530s and has a 105-foot dome at the center where you can't help but feel small in the presence of God. Another example is right here in our own backyard uh, at St. Andrews in Roanoke. Holly and I have gotten a chance to go there with some of our Catholic friends, and it is a unique feeling to have wonder be an essential part of the worship service that you're in when you're in that space. But we as a modern society have a hard time just being in wonder. Mysteries are a problem to be solved or explained. 
When God reveals himself or aspects of his character or designs for the world, what he doesn't tell us is, here's something about me, organize it, categorize it, make sense of it. That's what I want. No, he invites us to a lifetime of knowing him and knowing how much we don't know, to love him and to worship him. Paul writes to the church in Colossus in Colossians 2 through through 8. Let me start that again. Colossians chapter 2, verse 2 through 3. It says that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom all in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He encourages them to be knit together in love to reach an experiential knowledge of God's mystery. Because worship is being in a state of wonder and loving that we don't know at all. I love this verse in Isaiah 29, 14. It says, Therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people, with wonder upon wonder, and the wisdom of the wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. A rabbi uh, by the name of Abraham Joshua Heschel, on his deathbed, has this quote. He said, Never once in my life did I ask God for success or wisdom or fame. I asked for wonder, and he gave it to me. May we be able to say the same thing. How much of God's wonder do you experience, and are you content with that? So we're going to pause here and think about this um, in our discussion groups. Um, So here's what we'd like you guys to discuss for a little bit. Um, What are the aspects of the gospel story uh, that make you feel wonder, and how do you feel about not fully understanding aspects of God? And our kids are going to be in the back, and they're going to talk about uh, how they would explain the gospel story. I am so excited to hear what they say about that. Uh, And what are your favorite parts, and what parts are hard for you to understand? So go ahead and get in some discussion groups, and let's talk about these things. So um, what can help us then get to this state of wonder, right? That's, That's what we want to try to get to. How do we free our minds from the need to control and to know and to get to that place where we can just enjoy God's unknowability. Uh, simply, we, we can't. Uh, we can't do that on our own. Uh, we need God to do that for us. We have to ask God for a peek into how he sees the world. Right? We need his eyes to be able to see that. In 1 John 5, 14, it says, And this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, that he hears us. And so we do this through prayer and talking to the God who made this story of rescue and redemption possible. We need to be so deeply in love with him and in love with the gospel that we can't help but thinking about it, that we let it soak into every moment of our day. When you're on your way to work, let it remind you how God sent Jesus to do the work of saving the world. When you open up the oven and are excited for the upcoming meal, let it remind you of the tomb opening and the resurrected Jesus bringing life. When you're cleaning stains off your clothes, let it remind you of how Jesus cleansed the world of sin. Every moment is an opportunity to remember the gospel. And it may seem cheesy, but God is a romantic after all, and he loves that. I remember the first time someone presented this idea to me of seeing the gospel everywhere. I was in middle school in Florida, and we were on a field trip. Uh, We were kayaking at a park. And in Florida, there are these trees called mangroves. They're really interesting trees. Uh, They sort of defy a lot of things that plants are supposed to do. Um, And they live in kind of brackish salt water. And so they have these big roots that lift the tree up out of the water. Those are the roots, not the the stems. Um, And so the tree stays up above the salt water. Um, But the roots are pulling in water, and salt is not good for trees. And so what every mangrove has, when you start to look, they all have a yellow leaf on the tree. This is the sacrificial leaf, where they send all the salt that the roots take in. Um, And so this leaf uh, is the sacrificial leaf, where the salt goes, uh, where the bad things that lead to its death are sent and killed so the rest of the tree can live right? That is the gospel, right? When we start looking for it, 
It's everywhere. Even nature can't help but tell the story of the sacrifice of Jesus to save the rest of humanity. In Job, there's a great passage in chapter 12, verse 7 through 9. It says, Ask the beasts, and they will teach you. The birds of the heavens, they will tell you. Or the bushes of the earth, they will teach you. And the fish of the sea will declare to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? So where in your day can you see the gospel? This week, pray through the gospel story. Tell it to yourself, your your spouse, your kids, anybody. And tell it to God in prayer. The gospel is the story of God and humanity, and it is worth telling again and again. So here's a way to get you started with just two questions. Uh, I'm sure people have been looking at this whiteboard. It's been haunting them with these uh, pieces of paper on it. So one way to think about talking about the gospel, here's the first question, is who is God? Okay, so God is, he's goodness and love. Uh, And he's the perfect father. Okay, so that's question one. Who is God? You can add whatever adjectives or descriptors you like. Second question is, who are we? The gospel is the story of God and people, after all. Right? Who are we? We are broken, hurt, rebellious. Right? Sinful would be another word. Question three, who is God? He is goodness. He is love. And he's the perfect father. And so because he is goodness and love and the perfect father, who are we now? Right? We are resurrected. We are no longer broken. We are whole. We are new. And as the perfect father, we are his children. Notice something here that God doesn't change, right? He is goodness and love and perfect. We change because of our interaction with God. The gospel is good news that leads to the kingdom of the God of wonder being made known among the people of this world. So I want us to spend some time in prayer Um, just individually, and I want us to pray through the gospel. Thank God for these things. Go through these questions of who he is and who are we, right? You can go back and forth just asking those two things as many times as you want, but repeat the story over and over again of what is the gospel, who is God, and who are we. So let's spend some time in prayer. But pray through the gospel. Tell the story. And don't just tell others, but tell God the story too. I think we get into a mindset where we can feel the story of Jesus is overdone and the same old thing, but maybe we feel this way not because we know the story so well, but because we don't know it well enough. Think of your favorite movie. How many times have you seen it and invited other people to see it as well? One of my brother and I's favorite movies is the Goofy movie. Uh, And upon first viewing, it's a good movie, but it came out the same year as Toy Story, and so it gets overshadowed every time. Um, But um, 
uh, we don't really realize how good it is until you've watched it many, many times. Um, my brother and I have probably watched that movie 50 times um, because the songs and the dialogue strike us in a new way every time we watch it or we catch things that we didn't notice before. We're now in our 30s, and last week my brother sent me a YouTube video that he had made breaking down the story structure of the Goofy movie and how it subverts typical story structure and the songs like line up with certain plot points and all of that. Um, but not to mention, again, thinking of our theme here, that when you, you can also see the story of the gospel in the Goofy movie, the story of a son wanting nothing to do with the father, but the father keeps pursuing him in love regardless. Uh, we love that movie even more every time we see it. But that's only possible because we watch it again and again and again. And God demonstrates that beauty of repetition and enjoying a story to its full richness. He puts his story together over centuries and doesn't get tired of hearing his children tell it. God doesn't get bored of the same prayers over and over again either. As Russin mentioned a few weeks ago, God loves what Brennan Manning calls magnificent monotony. G.K. Chesterton in his book Orthodoxy describes it like when you make a face and a baby starts laughing. So they say, do it again, and then you make the face again, and they say, do it again, and you do it again and again and again with just as much laughter every single time, right? The child never gets bored of it. And so when God sees the sunrise, he says, do it again, and the next day, and do it again, and do it again, because he never gets over how beautiful it is. Josh Porter uh, notes that God is first an artist and then a historian. In the beginning, God created. God smiles every time he hears us tell the story of the love of Jesus. He never gets over how beautiful the story of the gospel is. So why do we? Who are we to say it's not complex enough or good enough or interesting enough or relevant enough? If we feel this way, the problem is with us, that we have not sat with the gospel long enough. Jesus is an endless well of living water that we should never tire of drinking from. But God is also a God of grace and compassion for his children. He knows our hearts are prone to wander and like sheep that we go astray. And so Jesus created a physical picture to help us in remembering the story. It's a part of the Last Supper he had with his disciples before the crucifixion. and We call that thing communion. Paul describes it, this picture, in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. He says, For I have received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and saying, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You get to tell the story when you take communion. So we're going to take communion together now. Um, as you come up, we'll set up the, the stools with the cups. We have one uh, small tray that has the gluten-free crackers in it. As we take communion, remember the story of God's great love. Tell the story of the good news of Jesus. So back to Psalm 22. I know it's been a while since we were talking about it. Uh, Psalm 22 doesn't only end with the crucifixion. He points to the hope of new life with God as well. Look at Psalm 22, verse 27. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nation. David the king recognizes who the true king is. The hope of the world, the desire for rescue and restoration, can only be found in the Lord. David proclaims this again in another spot in Psalm, Psalm 102, verses 18 to 22. I'd like to read that for you. Look again for the gospel story. Let this be recorded for a generation to come, so that a people yet to be created, that would be us, may praise the Lord, that he looked down from his holy height, from heaven the Lord looked at the earth, to hear the groans of the prisoners, to set free 
those who were doomed to die, that they may declare in Zion the name of the Lord and in Jerusalem his praise when people gather together and kingdoms to worship the Lord. Jesus prayed this in the Lord's Prayer as well. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The gospel is good news that leads to the kingdom of God, the God of wonder, being made known among his people. This week, think about the stories you hear and the stories you're living. Tell the story of rescue and redemption. Tell the story of the good news of Jesus.